good to be back here. I was here in November, and thanks for letting us come back, and thank you for the privilege to preach tonight. I want to say to Bible Baptist Church, thank you for your faithful support of Heartland Baptist Bible College. It allows us to continue to do what we're doing, which is what? Well, uh, train men and ladies for the ministry. And uh, we're a Bible college. That's all we do. Uh, we've been doing that for 25 years, and we don't have an extra grind with anybody else, but we're not a liberal arts uh, we're not uh, worried about nursing degrees, although I'm thankful for nurses. I am, but we don't have anything like that. We've got pastors and missions and music and youth and education and secretarial and just basically training young men and young ladies for the ministry to go out and serve the Lord. And let me tell you what that does. A lot of things it does, but one thing it does is it allows these young men and young ladies to graduate debt-free. That's a big deal. And then I can tell you at least two, and there's more than two, but I know two that could have had a nice cushy position on a staff somewhere, and they chose to go work with a church planner and get a full-time job. They couldn't do that if they had a lot of debt. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much for your support of Heartland Bass Bible College. We appreciate it so very much. I want to invite you to take your Bible with me tonight. Turn with me to the book of Acts chapter number 12. I'm going to consider just one verse tonight. There's a context to this verse, and uh, I trust it to be a help. I certainly want it to be a blessing to you tonight, and maybe an encouragement, and, and possibly maybe even a rebuke. But I want to preach about this. I want to preach about prevailing prayer and how that works in a New Testament church. Would you look with me? At verse number 5 of Acts chapter number 12, the Bible says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. There's a lot packed in there tonight, and I'm going to see if I can unpack it here in these next few moments. Lord, we sure do love you tonight. And we thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the wonderful singing. I thank you for this group of people here called the Bible Baptist Church, Pastor Yoder. Lord, thank you that we can just come and assemble here tonight. Would you bless the Word of God as we look at this particular verse tonight in the context here? And would you use it to be a help and encouragement to your people tonight? And I pray you'll speak through me and use me now in Jesus' name. Amen. As you come into chapter 12, verse number 1, the Bible talks about a man by the name of Herod. He is the king. And this would be Herod Agrippa I. He reigned from about 37 to 44 A.D. And he was the grandson of Herod the Great in Matthew chapter uh, 2 that killed all the babies. Now, this particular Herod, despite being raised and educated in Rome always was on shaky ground with the Roman government. And he ran up numerous debts in Rome, and he fled, and he came to uh, Palestine. And then there were some un not nice things that he said about the emperor, and the emperor promptly had him imprisoned. And then upon the emperor's death, he was released, and he was made uh, king. But remember, Rome was ruling the world. But basically, he, he was over a, peri a period of... Uh, land here in Jerusalem, in Judea, in that part of the world, and he had some authority. And Herod found one way here in this particular passage, he found one way to gain uh, favor with his subjects, and that was to persecute believers. He said, you know what, if I can do that, maybe these people like me. Well, the Bible says that he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because this pleased the Jews, he said, tell you what I'll do. I'll take me another preacher and I'll kill him. But the Bible says there, notice in your Bible, the Bible says then were the days of unleavened bread. And so he's going to hold him until after Easter. I don't have time to get in. It's not the message today. But can I tell you? That's the Feast of Easter. Herod was not a Jew. He was an Edomite. He is, he is waiting to celebrate a pagan, pagan a, a, a festival there at that time. But soon as that's over, he's going to bring Peter forth and he is going to kill him. But something happens. The church got together and they began to pray for this man called Peter. Now, I just want to make sure I, I make this here because this is important. The Bible says that he was guarded by four quintarians of soldiers. That's 16 men. 
Not only that, the Bible also tells us that he was he had two chains round about him. It's in the context. Not only that, there are keepers. Not only that, there, he's behind an iron gate. Not only that, he's in two wards. And so I want you to understand tonight that the context tells us that Peter is guarded very closely, very securely, but prayer was made. And that makes a difference. Now you think about this. Herod had closed all the doors round about Peter and he made sure the prison was secure. But there's one door that Peter, excuse me, that Herod could not shut for Peter and the church. And that's the door of heaven. And I want to submit to you tonight that whatever you're facing in your life, whatever kind of prison you might be in tonight, maybe there's somebody here tonight, you're in discouragement, or maybe you're a little in despair. There's all kinds of things going on in your life. Can I tell you, to the individual that knows how to pray, there's always a door open. And it, it does not matter what the Herods of this world do. So prayer was made. I want you to listen to this. Prayer can do anything that God can do, and God can do anything. Now think about that. Prayer is something that we have at our disposal. And I would submit to you, I can't speak for anybody else in this room today, but I will speak for myself. All of my failures in my life are prayer failures. And if I have failed at anything in my life, it's because I have failed in this matter of prayer. So I want to make just a few statements here tonight and just... A couple things here and get down to the nitty gritty where I want to end tonight. But I want you to think about this. When the Bible says... But prayer was made. I want you to think about the ministry of prayer in this church here. Now, just keep in mind here, ladies and gentlemen, that the Bible Baptist Church of Brookings, South Dakota, when you come together and when you pray, there's a lot of power in that. There's power in one person's prayer. I don't want to, I don't want to diminish that by any means, but I want to say this, that when the church comes together and they're assembled together and they're praying, I'm going to tell you, they can have a very effective ministry. I pastored for 19 years at Tulsa Baptist Temple, Tulsa, Oklahoma. One of our missionaries back in the 60s, their name was Elmer and Mary Deal. They were missionaries in the Congo. They died, uh, Brother Elmer died in the last 10, 11 years, but in their lifetime, they established established 182 churches. That's quite a feat. But the story is told quite vividly, it's been told to me by the former pastor, that somewhere in the 60s, somewhere mid-60s, he got up on a Sunday morning and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what's going on, but we need to get on our knees and we need to pray for Elmer and Mary Deal in the Congo because I really sense they need our prayers. Unbeknownst to the pastor, unbeknownst to the church in Tulsa, at that very moment they were in their home under a mattress with enemies from two enemy armies firing bullets over them, and God spared their life. Well, how did that happen? Well, I'll tell you why. Some people got together that were assembled together in a place, in a, in, in a church, in an ecclesia, and God answered their prayer. There is a ministry. So may I just, I'm just going to just cut to the chase here because one of the things that I want to encourage you as a church to do, and I'm not saying anybody doesn't do this because I'd imagine there are people here that do that, but I can, I, if I can get you to do one thing as a church, if you're not doing it, one thing you can do that will really help you, pray for that man right there. He's got a big bullseye on him. And if the devil can mess up him, he can mess up a lot of people. Is everybody with me tonight? I pray for my pastor every day. God, would you keep him safe from the evil one? Would you give him wisdom? Would you deliver him from people that have wrong motives? God, would you help his ministry to be received when he gets up and preaches the word of God? God, would you help him to be refreshed in his body and in his spirit? Because I'm telling you, the man of God needs your prayers. And that's something you can do as a New Testament church. Somebody help me out here tonight. I'm not saying you don't do that, but I'm saying everybody ought to do it because the man of God needs it. Not only that, there are people in this church, no doubt there are people you're praying for that are lost. There are people that need to get right with God. There's people that need a touch from God in their body. And I'm just telling you, there is power in prayer. But we got to get together and we got to pray. Is everybody with me? There was a ministry of prevailing prayer that took place here in this church. But I want you to notice something else here. And I want to focus on verse number 5. And I want you to notice what the Bible says about the manner of this prevailing prayer that takes place in this passage. Would you notice here in verse number 5, and I'm going to point out 
a couple of statements here and make a little application as we go through this. I want you to notice the frequency of the prayer. It was without ceasing. All right, so there's a verse over there in 1 Thessalonians 5, I believe it's verse 17, where Paul says, pray without ceasing. And without ceasing was used of a hacking cough. <clears throat> and you continually, it means you just continually cough. Doesn't mean you're coughing 24-7, but you continually cough. Well, may I remind you that when we pray, we're to continually pray. I can pray. By the way, I prayed driving here today. <laughs> And I didn't shut my eyes and bow my knees because I couldn't do that. But you can talk to God when you're driving down the road. And I'm just telling you, we need to frequently pray. Pray without ceasing in our individual lives. Because many times, I want you to think about this, many times the Lord meets us at the very point of desperation. And we need to, keep, we need to be diligent. If I can say that, we need to be diligent until we get... The answer to our prayers. You may be saying here, Brother Rocky, I've been praying for X, Y, Z. It just just doesn't seem to come through. Can I remind you that in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel was praying for 21 days from an answer from God. And God heard it on the very first day. But it took him 21 days to get the answer because there was satanic interference that was there. And you can read that in Daniel chapter 10. You and I don't know. We don't have any clue what kind of interference is going out here in the spiritual realm. But I'm telling you, it is always right to continue to pray. Pray without ceasing. We need to be frequent in that. It's not something, well, you know, if if I don't get it, I'm going to quit and I'm going to go on to the next thing. No, ladies and gentlemen, we need to continually pray. But I want you to notice something else about that word without ceasing. In our King James Bible, in Luke chapter 22 in verse number 41, this same word that's translated without ceasing here is translated in that passage more earnestly. So without ceasing, not only does it speak of the, of the frequency of praying, but it also speaks of the fervency of praying that we are to be involved. It has the idea of intenseness. It has the idea of earnestness. It has the idea of fervent. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, Jeremiah says, God says, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. See, I'm afraid sometimes that we just give God a little bit. A little bit. Uh, one of the things I enjoyed in, in my first year of Bible college uh, is this, and I'd never been exposed to this. Some of you, you you're going to say, that's weird. That's okay. It's all right. It, it, it was weird to me, but I kind of like it. And I don't get to do it too often. But we had a prayer room <clears throat> at our church where we <clears throat> had the Bible college, and I had a bunch of group of men here with me that were my age, and they said, hey, we're going to go up the prayer tower, and we're going to spend some time in prayer. Why don't you come with us? And because like begets like, I said, I think I like that. Okay, you'll get that if you think about it. And so that was my crowd, and so we got together, so we got in this prayer room, and they all got down, and they, stall, uh, they all started praying out loud. You may say, well, that's confusing. Well, listen, if you're talking to God, it's not confusing. But I'm going to tell you what it was in there. What it learned, what it taught to me is that I need to be earnest in my prayers. I don't need to have a... T- well, you know, if God doesn't answer, I'll just do something else. I need to be fervent in my prayer. I need to be asking God, God, I need you to do this. I need you to work in my life. I need you to touch this here. I need you to meet this need. We just need to be fervent and seek God with all of our heart. Heart. Listen to this. The Bible says in James chapter 5, verse number 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And too many of God's people have a take it or leave it attitude when it comes to prayer. If it doesn't work out, I'll just try something else. I'm just telling you, without ceasing here, not only does it speak of the frequency, but it also speaks of the fervency and the intenseness of their prayer. But notice this next phrase here. Prayer of the church. Let's see, Jesus said over there, I know what the context is. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I understand that. But Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 21, verse 13, that my house shall be called an house of prayer. So I want you to think about something, ladies and gentlemen. There are people who may not come through the doors of this building to tend here because you invite them, but they can't escape your prayers. You can talk to God about them. 
I've got so-and-so here that I'm trying to witness to and I'm trying to get them to come to church. And I want you to understand tonight that prayer can go places you can't go and it can do things that you can't do because God is the one that's answering the prayer. God is the one that is involved in what we do. And I'm telling you, I'm just, I just want, I want to encourage you tonight. And I'm not saying you're not. So please don't think, oh, he's just down. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying to you that Bible Baptist Church, I'm telling you, it ought to be, it ought to always be fervent in their prayers when they ask God for people to get saved, for people to be healed, for people to get right with God, for people that are dealing with burdens in their life. People, there are people that have broken hearts. And I'm just telling you, there's a lot of power in the prayers of God's people when they unite their hearts together and they ask God to do something specific. I just thought of this. I didn't even write this down. But I remember back, and I was just a little kid. I was three or four years old. And I remember, I've been told this, I remember from my mom telling me that my dad was going to have to have back surgery. If he's going to have back surgery, he was going to be laid up for about a year and not able to work. And and, And my mom said, we got together at church on a Wednesday night. And all of the church got together and they had special prayer for my dad. It's about 1970, 69, somewhere in there. And they prayed and they sought God. And guess what? He didn't have to have surgery. You can say that's a coincidence. You say whatever you want to. But I, I still believe that God answers prayer. And I believe that James says that we have not because we ask not in James chapter 4 in verse number 2. And I'm telling you, we need God to work in us and through us in our prayer life as a New Testament church. All right? Now notice something else here. Notice something else in your Bible. Who are they talking to? Unto God. Everybody see that there in your Bible? They're making prayer unto God. You see, and you need to understand that that the church's hope was in God, not in Herod, that that Herod would let him go. We're asking God to help this man get released from prison. And understand this, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to remind you tonight that when we pray, we are talking to the God of the universe. We are not talking to the ceiling, we're talking to the God that is, that made us and in Him we have and move and have our being. We could be like the little girl that grew up in a home, you know, where they hail Mary and all that kind of stuff. And her parents came sitting one night and said, hey, have you said your prayers tonight? And, and she said, well, sort of. And they said, what do you mean, sort of? And he said, well, I just thought God got tired of hearing the same thing over and over. So I just sat down and told him the story of the three bears. Well, I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to tell God the story of the three bears. You can tell him what's in the innermost parts of your heart and your mind because he hears. And not only that, he sees. And we're talking to the God that is. Oh, mercy. I'm just thinking so many things here in my mind. I'm thinking when Jesus taught his disciples to pray in Matthew chapter 6, verse number nine, verse number nine when you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven. Hey, he's our Father. He's our Father. And listen to me. Listen, if and I'm a father and I'm a grandfather. But I'm telling you, if my kids come and say, Dad, I need this. Ha ha! I'm not going to give that to you. You think I'm going to do that if I have the ability to do that? Come on. Our God, our God's a good God. He's a very good God. So they were talking to God. All right? Now notice this here. We're going to have to park here for a minute. Notice the last two words are verse 5. For him. What's the big deal about that? Well, uh, their focus was on Peter specifically. And I want you to get this. If you don't get anything else tonight, please get this here. There was one specific request they were praying for. Lord, would you help Peter to get out of prison? Well, what do we learn from that? Here's what we learn from that. We need to pray for specific requests so that when God answers specific requests, we'll know that God did it. John chapter 14, verse 13, Jesus said, Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Here's what we do. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just telling you. I've been around the block a time or two, and here's what I've heard people say. And I, as a pastor, at the churches I pastor, I heard people say, Lord, bless all the missionaries. Well, hey, folks, there's a bunch of missionaries out there. And they all got names. Let me help you. And they all got a field where they're at. And, and here, you know, here's what I do, because I don't have a good memory anymore, brother. I don't, Brother West, right? I don't have a good memory anymore. So I got a prayer list. 
I got a prayer book. I call it a prayer journal. And you know what I've got in there? I've got names of missionaries. I've got the field they're on. And every day I go through that list and I ask God and I call their name before the throne of God because I want God to bless them specifically. I'll tell you what it'd be good for you to do. It'd be good if you had a list of everybody's name in here that you're a member with so you could pray for them by name and call their name out to God every day so that God could hear them and bless them. Because their specific prayer is they're praying for Peter. Listen to this. When the man came and Jesus was teaching on prayer in Luke chapter number 11, and he told that story and he said, you know, i got a friend that's come at midnight and I don't have any food to give them. He didn't say, hey, I need some bread. It's not what the book says. He said, I need three loaves. By the way, a loaf was the day's provision, so he's asking for a big request. He's asking for three days' provision. <laughs> Because God's big enough. Sometimes, sometimes we treat God like He's nobody. But our God owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. And Jesus was saying, this man asked for three loaves of bread. Well, what does that mean? It means He was very specific in what He was asking for. When that man lost his axe head in 2 Kings chapter number 6, and Elisha said, where fell it? He didn't say, I don't know, it's somewhere in there. He said, right there. It's specific. Is everybody with me? God wants us to pray specifically. Uh, you know what? I, maybe you do. I don't. I don't. I don't ever do this. I've never done this. I'll never go into a restaurant and sit down, a, a high dollar restaurant, and say, "Bring me some food." I don't care what it costs. Now I've never done that. You know why? Because I may not be able to afford it. See, when you go into a restaurant, a nice sit-down restaurant, and you get a menu, first of all, you're looking to see, what can I, what do I want? Number two, most importantly, what can I afford? You're specific. Is everybody with me? When you go to the grocery store, ladies, you just don't get a grocery cart and say, just put, just put it in there. It didn't matter. Just put it all in there. We'll just buy the whole store out. No, you're very specific. If you're like my wife, she would get the ads out and say, okay, this is on sale this week. I'm going to get that. I'm just telling you, very specific. That's how we need to be in our prayers. You know what I find as I read my Bible? I find there are people that prayed some very specific Definite prayers like they did here because their prayer was for Him. That was where their focus was at. In, I just read this just this morning in my Bible reading. I, I started the life of Gideon in Judges chapter 6. And in Judges chapter uh, 6, in verse number 36 and verse number 37, he asked, he said, Now Lord, would you help that fleece to be wet and help the ground to be dry? And it was so. And the next day he said, Would you help that fleece to be dry and the ground wet? Well, somebody says, What is that? That's specific. It's exactly what it is. Uh, here's another. Now you say, well, now Brother Rocky, that's apples and oranges. No, I'm, the point is this. It's specific. How about this? How about the servant of Abraham in Genesis chapter number 24? He asked God, God, would you give me the very girl that, my, uh, that, that Isaac needs to marry? And would you even allow her to say, drink and I'll give your camels drink also? Can I tell you, you may read that and you may read just through that and not even think about what was involved in that. But ladies and gentlemen, that's not a 15 minute job. If she's going to draw for all those camels, it's going to take close to an hour, if not more than an hour. But he's asking very specifically. And he no more gets through praying. And Rebecca comes out and said, uh, drink, Lord, and, uh, and I'll give your camels drink also. How about that? You know why? By the way, if people prayed that specific today for mates, God would give them what I truly believe that. Because sometimes we don't pray specifically. How about Joshua in Joshua chapter 10? I read this earlier in my Bible reading this week. And he said, Son, stand thou still. That sounds pretty specific. What I'm trying to get you to see, ladies and gentlemen, is that the church at Jerusalem was praying for Peter. They were very specific. We need to get him out of jail. We need to get him out of prison. And that's how we need to pray when we pray. Because God wants us to be very specific in our prayer lives when we pray. Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, What things shall ever you desire when you pray? Believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. That doesn't mean I want a million dollars. I want a Lamborghini. Because ladies and gentlemen, when we're walking with God and we're delighted in God, His desires become our desires. I believe that. He gives us the desires of our heart. So watch this real quick. So I'm just let me say this. Be specific. Be definite, 
Be explicit when you pray. I think that's so very important. That's what they were doing here. Now, I want you to notice this here real quick. We're doing good. I want you to notice the miracle of prevailing prayer because there really was a miracle that took place here. So I want you to notice this here in verse number, uh, verse number 6. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was... What does your Bible say? He's sleeping. Between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. prison. So you need to understand this, that Peter in just a few hours is going to die. And he's sleeping. Now I'll just tell you, Pastor, I don't know that I could do that. But I don't need to do it right now. But if every time, if the time ever comes, hey, I'm going to die. I, I want God to give me grace, and I want God to give me peace, and I'd like to be able to like Peter and just go to sleep, thinking, you know, I might wake up in heaven. I, but the point is this: He was sleeping here between these two soldiers here, and listen, it was a late answer that God answered. But God always comes at just the right time. Because God is never early, He is never late, He is always right on time when it's time to come. And sometimes I think, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think, well, God's never going to come and answer this prayer. God's never coming through. But I'm going to tell you, He always comes right on time. I want you to notice something else here. Look at verse 7 and 8. Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, had to wake him up, raised him up, saying, Rise up quickly! Boom, his chains fell off from his hands. How about that? He couldn't do that, but God could. Verse number 8. Now watch this. I want to show you something. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And say to him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. So I want you to notice this. That Not only did the angel have to awaken Peter. Here's this man who is sleeping, who is about to be killed. And notice this. Notice he took time to get dressed. Let that soak in for just a second. He took time to put sandals on. He took time to put a garment round about him. Well, why? Because he's being delivered. He's not escaping. So here's an important principle I tell all of our students. I let them know this. Please listen to this. The Holy Spirit of God will never stampede you He will only lead you. And if you feel, oh, because I'm telling you, as a pastor, every dumb thing I did that got me in trouble was because I felt pressured to do so. I'm telling you, the Spirit of God doesn't pressure you. He leads you. He guides you. And so Peter took time to get dressed here. But I'll tell you who will pressure you. (laughs) The devil will. Look down here, verse 10. Real quick, look at this. So when they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of his own accord. All right. So I want you to notice this, that the angel did everything for Peter that Peter couldn't do for himself, but Peter opened that iron gate of his own accord. And there's something I learned from that, ladies and gentlemen, and listen to this. Uh, prayer can do, it can, it can do a lot of things, but it won't do everything. Because there's some things God wants you to do. Now, think about that. i got I got to move on, but think about that. Peter couldn't get out of prison, but he could open that iron door. It, it opened. He just pushed on it. It came, it came open. And can I say to you, and, I, and, and here's what I, I think I'm trying to, to say. Prayer can do anything. Here it is, but he doesn't do everything. And some things Peter had to do for himself. And we're going to find here in just a second that it was harder for Peter to get in a prayer meeting than it was to get out of jail. It was. And so he went over here to this house. There's a young lady here whose name is Rhoda. And Peter's knocking on the door. Verse 13, Rhoda came and she said, Ah, it's Peter. She ran back in. She doesn't bother to open the door. She goes back in here and gets the people say, Hey, Peter's at the door. And they said, You're crazy. You're mad. Oh, well, now wait, wait, wait. They're just praying for God to deliver him. They're just saying, God, we want you to deliver him. And now we, oh no, it's his angel. He died. Verse 16, but Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished, which means they're, oh! Because God answered their prayer. 
You know, I do the same thing when God answers my prayers. Well, look at that. Look what God did. And they learned. They learned. Please listen. They learned that God answers prayer in His time. Now let me leave you with this. And I'm done. What is the message? What, what, what do we need to learn from this tonight? Is there anything to learn from this? Well, sure. It, if there's not, I wouldn't even bother to tell you. Or I wouldn't even bother to look at this, but there is something. And here's what I want you to learn from this tonight. Real quick, a couple things and I'm done. Here's what we need to learn. This is something that I learned 25 years ago after having pastored for five years. I learned this. It's called, <coughs> this, this is a word that people don't like in 2023, but it's still a good word, discipline. We need to have the discipline to pray and to spend time with God. And here, here, here is all that discipline is. Discipline is a matter of bringing my body into subjection. It is me telling my body, this is what you're going to do, bud. Because, I, I, you know, and I'm at a point now, I'm at a point now my body tells me, uh, get up before the alarm goes off. It, it just, that's where I'm at. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm 56, so I'm not over the hill, but I'm not young anymore. <laughs> But I can tell you this, I look forward to my prayer time. And I have made it a daily habit. I have made a daily part of my life because I need to spend time with God. And I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that's what we all need. Just the discipline to pray. I have no doubt tonight that I'm talking to people here and you do that. So let me just give you these three truths. Just three practical truths and we're done. Number one, if you're going to have discipline, you ought to have a set time to do it every day. Well, I'll just do it whenever. Well, you'll never do it. Is everybody with me? You say, well, I'll do it. No, I, you, there needs to be a set time. It needs to be a daily activity. It needs to be a habitual activity. It needs to be a way of life. Let me make sure I say that. And then you really need some place you can just be by yourself. A closet at home. I have a man cave. Oh, I miss my man cave. I'm looking forward to getting back to my man cave because it's my cave. It's my place where I can go and I can spend time with God. And you know what? You can be a closet. You can be in your bedroom. you just somewhere where you're by yourself. You can even take a blanket. I've seen people take a blanket and just get alone by themselves. But you need a place where you can talk to God. And then you need this. You need a steady habit. Do you ever wonder why people just do this? And not even think about it, because it's a reflex. It's a habit. And if people can have bad habits, I'm going to submit to you they can have good habits. And how do you make a habit? Well, I read this. I think it works because it worked for me. Do you know you can develop a habit in 39 days? If you'll do it the same way, in the same place, at the same time every day for 39 days, you'll just do it. It'll just be a part of your life. Can I tell you, if people have bad habits, and they do, we need a good habit to pray and spend time with God because prayer was made for this man, Peter, and the church got together and they prayed. But listen, listen, we need that in our own individual lives. And I want to encourage you tonight. I want to encourage you that if you don't have that kind of a prayer life, you can. And if you've got one of those, hey, praise God, hallelujah, keep it up. Don't change. Keep on doing it. But if you're not, the encouragement tonight is start. I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes. Thank you so much for your kind attention to the Word of God this evening. I, I appreciate that. I want to ask you just a couple of questions and then we'll have our invitation. I'm going to turn it over to the pastor here in just a second. But I want to ask you a question tonight. I'm asking. I'm not, I'm not accusing. I'm not, I'm not even trying to poke or prod tonight. I'm just asking. <clears throat> Do you pray? I'm asking. Consistently, habitually, is that a part of your life? Do you have that discipline to pray every day? You can start. I would encourage you. Well, I don't. Well, I would encourage you to start 10, 15 minutes a day. Just, just something. You, you're not going to go out here and if you're not lifting weights, you're going to start go out here and start lifting 150 to 200 pounds. You have to work up to that. And it's going to take a little while. But I just want to encourage you. Be people of prayer. 
And maybe there's someone here tonight, maybe in your own individual life, God has spoken to you, God has pointed something out about your prayer life, or maybe He's trying to encourage you in your prayer life. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I just know this is where God directed me to be tonight in this particular place, in this particular part of the Word of God. And evidently, evidently, somebody needs some encouragement or somebody needs to say, you know what, I need that in my life. And you'd be here and you'd say, Brother Rocky, I'm here tonight. I know I'm saved. I'm born again. But God spoke to me about my prayer life tonight. My, no, I'm talking about your spouse. I'm, not talk, I'm talking about you as an individual. God spoke to me tonight and encouraged me. I, I, I need to be busy about this. I need, to, I, need to, I need to really take this seriously and make it a discipline and have my life. Brother Rocky, would you pray for me? You just hold your hand up. God bless you tonight. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Well, that's between you and the Lord. I'm just the messenger. You do with it whatever the Lord would have you do tonight. Let's stand together. Father, sure do love you tonight. Sure do thank you for the Word of God. And I thank you that we have the privilege to call you our Father and to pray and just to seek what we need from you. So I pray. I I saw quite a few hands tonight. You know every need in every individual heart. And I'm asking you, Lord, to bless those needs that are represented by a raised hand and maybe even some that didn't raise their hand tonight. You know all about that. Lord, just bless and encourage people and help them to be and to do what they need to do in their individual life. Now in this invitation time, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to come tonight, as the pianist begins to play, you do whatever God would have you do, and I'll turn it over to the pastor.